Good evening, everybody. My name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design, and it is truly a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program called Joseph Walsh, Crafting the Contemporary. So let me introduce our presenter and moderator for the evening, Daniela Ohad. In addition to being a member of our outstanding NYSED faculty, Daniela is a design historian, an educator, a writer, and a tastemaker. Since receiving her PhD from the Bard Graduate Center for Studies in the Decorative Arts, Design, and Culture, Daniela has been committed to education in design history and theory, the history of the interior, material culture, and the decorative arts. She has a special expertise in modern and contemporary design culture, which actually makes her ideal uh, for, to be this evening's host. Good evening to you all. This is the Design Week. There are so many events, so thanks for being with us. And I would like to introduce you to Joseph Walsh. Joseph Walsh is a master maker and designer who works in West Cork, Ireland, where he founded his studio in 1999 on his family farm. Walsh has formulated a unique and personal language based on the poetic sensibility and on the art of bending and manipulating local timbers to which he has recently added such materials as green marble, limestone, and resin. Walsh has become known internationally for his sinuous, flowing, graceful forms, for interpreting nature in his own way, and for the highest level of craftsmanship. He belongs to a new generation of designers who elevate crafts to a new horizon, who create objects of narrative, who embrace the intersection between handcraftsmanship and technology, and for whom workmanship and design are integrated within each other. His patriotic use of local materials, his revision of the language of furniture design in Ireland, and his strong presence in the international spotlight have made him into the ambassador of contemporary Irish design, national treasure. Whether furniture, sculpture, or architectural commissions, his pieces are always ambitious always have huge personalities, always characterized by fluid silhouettes, sensual, elegant, timeless forms. His objects are like twisted in unexpected directions, like floating in the air, as if they dance on the world stage. Traveling in his own path, Walsh creates furniture that tends to surround its users, to participate in their daily lives, pieces that are dramatic, dominant, art objects crafted to perfection. They also reflect his passion and motivation for the highest skills his craft can achieve, for constantly accomplishing, for constantly resolving complicated obstacles, for achieving the impossible. Contradictions are so present in his work that you are moving from the obstacles to the effortless, from the solid to the fluid, from the complex to the clarity. The panel Joseph Walsh Crafting the Contemporary comes to position him within the fabric of contemporary design and within that of his own Irish heritage. This talk coincides with an exhibition presented at the American Irish Historical Society, which opened two nights ago, and which will be on view until April 24th. I would like to thank the New York School for Interior Design and David for your uh, passion for Irish culture and for making this event possible, and also to the American Irish Historical Society and to Chris Cahill for co-sponsoring this evening and for supporting Joseph all along. Jennifer Goff, Curator of Furniture, Silver, and Eileen Gray Collection at the National Museum of Ireland. Jennifer is recognized as one of the world's leading experts on Gray's legacy. Her book, Eileen Gray, Her Work and Her World, is a comprehensive overview 
of Gray's fascinating biography, and Jennifer is a consultant in the upcoming exhibition on Eileen Gray at the Bard Graduate Center, and now currently Fulbright Scholar here at and at Columbia University. So, thank you. And Glenn Adamson. Glenn is currently Senior Scholar at the Yale Center for British Art and Editor-at-Large of the magazine Antiques, a curator, a theorist who works across the field of design, craft, and contemporary art. Glenn was, until March 2016, the director of the Museum of Arts and Design and previously head of research at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. He's considered one of the world's experts on contemporary design culture and on contemporary craft. And Joseph Walsh. So, Joseph, when I first saw your work a couple of years ago, and I saw this technical, not talking even about the language, but the engineering, the crafts, the perfection, I was thinking to myself, where did he go to school? And I was trying to guess where he went to school, but then I found out that you are totally self-educated, self self-trained. So. When and how did this start? I guess I grew up in a, um, a circumstance where um, the making of things was um, commonplace. Living on a farm where there were people working on the farm. There was one lovely man, John Sullivan, who was in, in a farm shed with a welder and gas torch and he was making bale trailers and gates and whatever. My mum made tapestries and so many things from cooking, growing fruit gardens, all, all sorts of extraordinary things. But in a very practical way, it was just the, the, the life on, on a farm. So the idea of making things uh, wasn't at all intimidating. It was just the way we grew up. And as kids, you were given tasks to do to um, help with the maintenance and uh, to go from maintaining to fixing something and fixing something to making something wasn't a very big leap. Um, so I think the, the, the first full-scale piece of furniture I made, I was 12. That was 1992. And um, it was a farmhouse dresser. And it, it took six months. It took forever. And I gave up a few times. And my mum came down to the workshop in the evening and kind of said, well, what's the problem? But if you put this here, it, it, it should work. And kind of extraordinary sense of achievement when you do it, uh, it became quite um, kind of And addictive. this is this is your studio, yeah. right? Yeah, so this is the farmhouse on the left and, and on the right is the corner of the workshop which is um, was an old potato shed. Jennifer, <laughs> you, you said that the best thing Joseph did was not to go to school. I think it Why? Was. Because I think walking away from a kind of a formal education, there's a kind of an organic nature. You said it in, in the interview. And he kind of drew. And it's very difficult to speak about you when you're sitting right next to me. <laughs> you sit down there if you prefer. <laughs> it's um, much easier for me. <laughs> but I think it's, it's, he basically drew on a traditional Irish kind of country furniture making. And... He has instilled in it a new lyricism, a, an organic nature. There's a romanticism that's also come through in the work. And I think as the years have gone on, he is constantly questioning, constantly challenging himself, the studio, those around him, and constantly inspiring. And the work is continuously evolving and changing. That's, um, Glenn, your book was Thinking Through Craft. So is this an advantage or disadvantage? It's an interesting question. I've had so many positive associations with so many art schools that I am hesitant to say that they're a bad idea. Um, <laughs> but certainly there's a kind of intuitiveness in Joseph's work, which I think is hard to capture if it's not built into you through your upbringing. I often find that people that do well in art schools don't follow directions anyway. So it might not be an either or. It might be that um, whether you're self-trained or whether you go through a formal educational system, the real question is whether you have something inside you that needs to get out 
And for some people, art school is going to be the pathway that allows them to do that, and some people are going to be clever enough to do it on their own. If you're a lot less self-taught than somebody who doesn't make anything until they're 18 and they go to art school, because you grew up in it, surrounded by it. And I was very struck by um, you know, your description of your upbringing and also your introduction in thinking that your training is much more like what a furniture maker would have had in the 18th century, mm -hmm. where they do start learning from the age of 12, where they're expected to have a certain set of facilities inherited, I suppose, or surrounding them early on. So you work in the same place where you grew up, but you've always looked outside. You're very aware of what's happening in the world. And I want to ask you first about Ireland and about what did you take from Ireland? And we see here a photograph that you chose. What, what do you take from Ireland, from the people, from the landscape, from the culture? Strangely, the, the work that I'm making now um, and its connection uh, to Ireland or landscape, if, 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 if indeed it, it is specifically that, somehow was quite influenced by New York. I had an exhibition here in, in New York at the Society, where the exhibition is now nine years later. And, you know, with each making technique that I was learning, I was looking to design with that technique and uh, so bending wood. And, and, and then that exhibition gave me this... I, I, I think it's a kind of a rare opportunity, in a way, to um, to see a body of work. There was 23 pieces in the exhibition from the previous five to six years. It, it gave me that objectivity of, of, you know, going back to Ireland and going, is that really me? And realizing the things I appreciated about Ireland in the landscape. We're quite close to the coast, so tides are so present and the wind is so present, the trees are going like this, and uh, how everything adapts and survives. And I guess that's what was a big part in influencing the start of the Enigmum series, which was the idea not to draw something on paper, resolve it, refine it, and then craft it, but more to draw something and imagine how it would be made, and then, and then the process is to make a model. and. That's an interpretation of the drawing, and when you make the piece, it's an interpretation of the model, and it's much more alive and adapting right through the process. And I think, for me, that's much more connected to the material and much more connected to the place, which is a, a very alive... I, I want to ask you specifically about Irish design, and Irish design, Ireland, was relatively late to depart from its traditional crafts and decorative arts, and it happened in the 60s with a very special project, national project. Can you say something about it, and also how did this pave the way, or whether it paved the way for Joseph's work? Ireland was continuously hit by recession, and we were a very poor nation. And it was a government initiative that began, and they invited uh, Kaz Frank, Eka Hulsa, and a number of, um, they were known, known in the Irish Times newspaper reports them as the invading Norsemen, and that we would be invaded by Vikings all over again. And they came to Ireland over a period of months, and they went around to the technical colleges, to the schools, they went to the craft-based industries, and they um, wrote a report on Irish design, and it became known as the Scandinavian Report. And the Scandinavian report literally changed everything because some people took it as a, a, a criticism of Irish design and really were quite indignant at what the report stated. Others really embraced um, what they were saying and how we needed to embrace our heritage and embrace our traditions and modernize them, bring them into the 20th century. So literally what began was in Kilkenny Design. It became known as KDW Workshops or um, Kilkenny Design Workshops. And it was an amazing initiative. They worked with Bloomingdale's here in New York, Heels in London. It became a very, very uh, big initiative. They had a number of studios that were down in Kilkenny and it's now occupied by the Design and Craft Council of Ireland. And they invited uh, Terence Conran came in, uh, Kaj, um, uh, Nano Ditzel came over, um, a number of international designers, and the bowls that you see here are from uh, Maria van Kestren, who came back to Ireland literally a number of years ago and did an exhibition again. But KDW um, is still, its essence is still there with the Design and Craft Council. 
it's been key in kind of showing Irish designers that we can work with international designers. Joseph is very much a, a leader in that role. It's, it's not what's gone as from the past, it's what we're going to see in the future. Some of the people you showed, um, Sarah Flynn, um, Joe Hogan, Liam Flynn, who unfortunately passed away, but an extraordinary maker. There was this ongoing pursuit of um, raising the culture, you know, raising uh, the, the, the expression, but the quality of execution, which took time and the quality, the, the culture of making. Um, and because it takes time, maybe it's a good thing. It, it, it takes a long time to go through the process, and then you reflect, having spent all that time, was that really a, a worthwhile journey? And it makes you kind of think long and hard about the next one you embark on, because it's... Uh, and they've had all, a number of those designer makers and, and, and artists and craftspeople in Ireland as a, as a group that have had a very consistent journey of raising the standard really consistently. Um, which I think is quite is a consistency there. There is a consistency there, but it also takes encouragement, not just from patrons and from clients, but from institutions. Glenn, in this landscape of global design, what's the, really the value of having a sort of national identity within your design? Yeah. Is this important? Well, it's... Uh, it has always been important, but it's more important now than it has been in the past because of the profusion of information that we live in. And I'll just cite something Wally Olins, the great brand consultant, once said to me. He said that he expected that when the internet came, his business would be all about everyone wanting to be global. And he said that, in fact, it was exactly the opposite. So, for example, when he would work with a city, like, let's say, Dublin, for example, um, before the internet, cities like Dublin so you might say sort of second tier cities, would always want to stress their internationalism. So they would want to say, we, also, we have this, this, and this, and this, like everybody else. And when the internet came, instead cities immediately started to say, we are special because we have always had this particular thing that you cannot find anywhere else. So it's like a kind of narrowing of uh, emphasis, which obviously implies a kind of cultural depth and I think that certainly applies to the design world also. So while you do have, of course, uh, hubs of internationalism in design, New York City being one of them, most places tend to emphasize locality now when they talk about themselves as design places. And of course, that inevitably leads to emphasis on craft because craft has a very strong association with tradition. It has a very strong association with indigenous materials and narratives of continuity. And so all of those things are much more powerful now because of this idea of distinction and distinguishing between yourself and everywhere else. So, Joseph, look at this picture. Your furniture has presence. It's so strong. It's so dynamic. And what really is the value of your furniture beyond the aesthetics, beyond the form, beyond the function? What, what is the value that you are giving to the people who live with your furniture? I, I, that's, a, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Not a good question. <laughs> but I'll answer it in case Michael does. Um, I'll try to answer it, Roder. Um, I, I, I guess, firstly, I, I don't separate the different aspects of... Uh, design and craft and the material and uh, the narrative of where it's from or for me it's a whole thing so um, these two pieces uh, it's the enigmum canopy bed and this freeform enigmum seat there's different variations so we've made I think eight beds since 2010 but the original idea was really about uh, creating this cocoon each of those beds are, are, are really quite individual, and hopefully the, the users have that same relationship to them of, you know, it, it's, there's only one. Um, the material has, has its own unique story, growing pattern, all this. 
um, the form is uh, coming from my expression in that particular time, sometimes the more dense, sometimes the more essential, and then uh, the execution, the, the making of it is, is also unique from that moment in time. So hopefully the whole thing comes together to be something truly unique and, and each person that lives with it finds the unique characteristics in it. Jennifer, what did you feel when you saw this, this piece for the first time? It's just, it's mind-blowing. It's absolutely mind-blowing. It literally, I kind of stood there and said, this transforms furniture design, it transforms craftsmanship. Um, it, there, there's like a, there was an organic nature to the whole piece. It's like a living entity. Your work engages, like physically, it's the tactility of the work. It's it's you literally just want to engage, you want to touch, you want to, like, you want to feel this piece. I mean, many of your pieces have a presence and owns the space, but this piece, it kind of transcended furniture. Was it architecture? Was it furniture? You are the curator at the National Museum of Ireland. Before you arrived to the museum, this piece was acquired and it's a part of the museum collection. This is um, Souvenus, it's a rocking chair from 2004. Four. Is this how it's been showcased right now in the permanent collection? It's currently in part of the exhibit and we continually rotate um, new designers and new um, makers and pieces that come in. Joseph, this piece was recently acquired by the Centre Pompidou? Yeah, this one about two years ago, I think. Two years ago? Yeah. yeah. And this one, where is this piece? When I return next week, we're installing it in the National Gallery of Ireland. So this was a competition about two years ago to make a sculpture for the entrance atrium. It's a sculpture gallery, a very large gallery at the, the National Gallery of Ireland. This is a development from work we started in 2014, uh, a series of work titled Magnus, which is really scaling up the Enigmum concept into kind of architectural scale, so you're able to walk within the pieces. Um, and the first two pieces we did were, were functional. Uh, the first piece was a desk, and it was made for the New Art Centre, Roach Court in England, um, an amazing gallery that started in 1958 and it's still run by the founder, a really, really special place in Salisbury. So we made this desk that, that then spirals through the room, so when you're sitting at the desk, you're, you're also under the sculpture form. And that led to a, a commission for a family church in Italy, in Verona. We made another Magnus installation there, again functional, with two ledges and oil lamps uh, made in Murano glass. And then. We did this competition two years ago, which I won to make this sculpture, so pure sculpture and no function. And this has been a really significant development, a development I enjoyed in terms of just making pure sculpture and all of the different iterations before arriving at this final form. But it's probably one of the high points, and there are a few in the last few years. One, which was a very large marble and, and resin different commission outside New York, and another one that's in this, this exhibition at the moment. But this is one of the high points in terms of the collaboration of skills within the studio and some people outside the studio. So we collaborated very tightly with Ovarp engineers on, on that, that large-scale sculpture. One of our, my makers, Remy Burr, a French maker who, who joined first in 2006 and then left, finished his training and came back and has been there for all of that Enigma series. So, you know, the, the refinement and sort of mastery of his skills and, you know, team underneath him uh, or working with him um, and understanding material and the collaboration with OVARP engineers and, and uh, some of the people like Martin McGloin who, who did all the technical drawings and everything for that piece. It, it was really an incredible exercise of just elevating the, all the skills and knowledge to realize that for sculpture. This is in the collection of the Mint. Yeah, Mint. Glenn, Mint. why museums should acquire, should have a piece of Joseph in their collection? Well, I mean, uh, what else would you prefer? You know, it's, I, I, I don't think there's anybody working in any country at the minute who has that, that much control over this particular material. Um, I mean, I was wondering, Joseph, when you proposed that sculpture, uh, that 80 foot long 
uh, piece, whether you even knew that you could make it, for sure. The initial proposal was smaller, actually. It was about four meters and on a stone plinth, and, and then they, they asked me if I had imagined it bigger. I said, well, of course, I'd imagined it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so they kind of to and fro for a while, and, and they gave me the opportunity to make it on the scale that, that, that I would have liked relative to the space and, and to make it as a permanent fixture so it's actually mounted within the space with a concealed in the floor. But in that phase, in that sort of six month window of discussing scale, we already entered into a kind of a phase of engineering analysis of, of could we really scale it to that, to that extent. So. But you know, it points to the answer to your question, which is that in addition to the obvious, you know, extraordinary quality of the work, I think it's very, very unusual to find somebody who has the kind of vertical integration of your studio. So it's funny because we're up against an Anish Kapoor talk right at the minute. It, it's a really interesting comparison because both Kapoor and Joseph make objects that have a kind of immediacy and a simplicity. Like you, you in your beautiful introduction, you said that there's complexity and clarity in the work, and that's certainly true of Kapoor as well. And you could probably spin out the comparison further to do with a kind of biomorphism, a sort of suggestiveness of form that's narrative, but only by implication, not by specific imagery, etc. But what's different is that Kapoor relies on these external fabrication scenarios. You know, he does have a big studio, but then he also has this kind of empire of people working to his... Um, extremely expert directions, but in a sense, the medium that he's working in is other people's skills, whereas in your case, it is your skill that you're then driving through other that, people's great, collaboration. Yeah, that's a great observation. I want to talk to you a little bit about your materials and processes, which is your expertise, Glenn. Uh, Joseph, tell us a little bit about how you choose your materials. This is a funny coincidence, but that, that sketch, that scribble, is, is that Lilium table that's in the exhibition. And these pieces are essentially kind of modeling how we might form the wood. And, and this is a series I enjoyed. While, it, while it's so different to, say, the Magna sculpture, which is so essential, and this is very intense and finely layered, um, it, I, I enjoyed it because it, it started, each one starts with this perfect geometry and then, then opens up and frays into a more freeform. This particular one is, is quite geometric, but some of them become really wild and, and frayed. Um, so material selection, I mean, working with wood, and, and now I work a lot with ash because it is freeform work and, and ash is very pliable. But you, you start to develop a, a very intuitive understanding of, of what you're looking for for any particular piece, what wood will lend itself to a nice form like this, which is quite open and demanding in a way. It's quite unforgiving compared to those very tight radiuses and, and layered is much more forgiving than something like this or the, the enormous Magnus with the 80 foot lens. You need really perfectly regular growing conditions to, to create something that's going to be that resolved in the end. And these are all local materials? Increasingly, we're working with sawmills in France, actually. And the French have been really uh, amongst the best, I would say, in the world in terms of their sawmills and their forests and managing the forests and the knowledge in the sawmills of the material. It's done with craftsmanship as opposed to, I suppose, the construction industry drives a lot of the demand for, for timber, and that's more volume and speed. And what about the stone? This is in a quarry in, in Connemara, and this was just an extraordinary undertaking in that Jose here is sitting on the ledge of a quarry. There's a table marked out in it, and it's the biggest block uh, that was ever extracted from that quarry. It was 18 tons. So we had to develop a technique to extract it with the quarry owners. So Jose and Mario, two of the guys working with me on, on stone, spent three months living in Connemara. Jose is from Tenerife and was in Connemara and started learning Irish and is now married to an Irish girl. Um, <laughs> but it was really an extraordinary adventure. It's, it's a beautiful material, um, but, but it has its challenges. I mean, all that color and character um, doesn't come without a kind of price in terms of interacting with the material. These are sketch models. So this is typically the start of the process, just drawings and then very quickly into sketch models where I do different iterations quite quickly and go from there into presentation models. 
This is at a, at a more advanced level. Does Miro one of our these really extraordinary uh, writing these uh, kind of interesting scripts and things? And this is really about taking a sketch model or a model or a direction we want to go with and, and um, the exchange uh, with, uh, say, OVARP engineering and thinking about access into logistics into a building and getting into that conversation, how we connect something to a building. And, and Miro has been studying some, a lot of our kind of freeform models and trying to write a, a script to, to map the behavior of the material. So when, for instance, we start to in, work with the engineers or look at logistics and we say, oh, what if we, we're, we need to push it a little bit this way, that he can alter the drawing and it will, will start to behave like the material. In, in any case, at the end of this process, then we make another model, one is to five. But um, this is a, has really leaped forward in the last three years because of the large, large scale work. Glenn, can you position Joseph within the context of contemporary designers working in such a complexity and really pushing the boundaries and very much in conversation with science and technology? Yeah, you know, you have to say we're very early on in the story because the tools that have come into uh, people's possession, like Jorn Verhoeven's Cinderella table here, which, by the way, was his master's thesis piece at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. So take that, people who are about to graduate from their MFA. Um, but, you know, we're just a few years into this, and it's amazing what people are doing already, of course, but I don't think any of us can conceive what's going to happen to the object landscape as a result of this. But already what you can see is that you have a tremendous proliferation of different ways that people are using technology. So the best way to think about it perhaps is that the digital and the analog are both extremely complex, productive situations in their own right. I mean, nobody would think that analog craft, in other words, non-digital craft, is a simple thing, particularly if you've spent any time in a wood shop. And no one would think that computer-aided design is a simple thing. But when you put them together, what you realize is you have this incredibly complex, multivariable environment. Like this one. Yeah, exactly. You can see that each of those designers is using technology in a totally different way. And then, again, Joseph's studio is also using it in a very different way. So even things that look superficially similar, like the way that Wendell Castle uses computer technology to drive a CNC carver on a robot arm, is totally different from the way that you work because that's not an aspect of your of your vocabulary at all. Jennifer, do you see that type of complexity in Irish design today, with the exception of Joseph's work? There are those that prefer to be called craftspeople rather than designers. They're, um, they might be furniture designers, but they don't do CAD, they don't work with computer automated design, they do everything by hand. So there is this dichotomy. I don't think it has matched in the makers studios that I've gone out to, you either have one or you have the other. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's exactly. I think as Glenn said, it's such a complex thing because if you look at the work Wendell is doing with the robot, it's basically a router on, a, on an arm. And people have the uh, misunderstanding in a way that, oh, the robot is making the piece. But actually, the craftsmanship remains because it's about um, having your tools sharp. It's about knowing the direction of that cutter relative to the grain. You're still working with wood, so the grain direction is still doing its, its own thing. And you need to bring that cutter rotation and direction exactly in the right direction, otherwise you won't get a clean cut. I, I want to ask you, Glenn, how do you think history is going to write Joseph's work within the context of bent wood furniture? And I want to say that there is somebody here, my Dear mentor, Derek Ostergaard is sitting there. He wrote the first book on bent wood furniture. So how do you think that history is going to write? Yeah, it's yes. certainly a better question for Derek than to me, but I'll, try, I'll give, to make a stab at it. You know, it's probably fair to say that nobody has pushed the boundaries of the possibilities of bent wood as much as Joseph has as quickly since Tonnet did in the middle of the 19th century. It's that kind of paradigm shift. So Greg's so-called elastic chair, you know, that was the first really significant experimentation with Bentwood furniture in, in America. And when Tonnet came along a few decades later, the explosion of sculptural possibility was, I mean, you can see immediately from those two images. And basically what Joseph is doing is a paradigm shift that great in our time. 
So whether or not somebody can make another leap in the future is hard to say. I mean, maybe you're reaching a kind of limit case of what can be done, and it will be interesting to see how that plays out even in your own career because you have many decades of work ahead of you, I'm sure. Um, but certainly it's hard to find a direct comparison apart from Conant in terms of that kind of transformative energy. Uh, okay. And Jennifer, I want to talk to you. I, we can't speak about Joseph Walsh uh, from Ireland without mentioning Eileen Gray, which is your expertise. I mean, can, is there a comparison? I mean, both of them really brought Ireland to the spotlight, to the international spotlight in terms of design. But I know, Joseph, you told me that you've always been mentioned in the same breath as Eileen Gray. You want to say something about that? Oh, no, I'm really under the hot spot. <laughs> um, how would I say? I wouldn't say that there are comparisons between the two of them, but there are parallels in kind of... Um, and they both have kind of set themselves uh, apart from others, but at the same time working with others in that they tested the boundaries, constantly testing the materials, challenging themselves. I mean, Gray was a self-taught designer. Um, Joseph is a self-taught designer. And she literally went from testing the boundaries with lacquer work, uh, then began testing the boundaries with chrome, nickel, plastics, cork, and then at the age of 52 decided to go into the world of architecture with no formal training. And that's a whole other story. One of the things with Gray is that she um, always challenged herself. And there was a, an article that you had done a number of years back, an interview. And um, you had said how the direction had kind of changed in the work from about 2004, 2005. And you really began challenging yourself with this new secret recipe um, that came from the farm. And um, you started off making the models and constantly testing until you got the model right. And then you sat there and said, crikey, I have to make this piece now. How am I going to do it? And I suppose it's the question of, of challenging yourself in, in achieving the impossible. So I think that's what Gray did, and I think that's what Joseph has done and continues to do. So my last question to you, Joseph works in Ireland. Is he Irish? Currently would probably be, for me, Ireland's greatest export. and wholeheartedly would embrace you as Irish, but with an international twist. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Glenn, is Joseph star designer? Oh, unquestionably. But, you know, it's, it's impossible to be a successful designer now without being a star. I mean, that, that's the, this, the brutal reality. The design now is comparable to Major League Baseball. I mean, if you're not playing at that echelon, then you cannot control literally the capital that's required to make work that will be, what do I want to say, historically relevant or will actually push things because it's such a competitive environment precisely because everybody is competing with everyone else right now. The difficulty is that Joseph is up against people in China in a way that Eileen Gray frankly wasn't. So you have this massive escalation in terms of visibility and direct uh, encounter between different designers, and it, it just has had an incredibly, um, you know, rigorous and demanding result in terms of what people have to do. So, I, I mean, to me, you know, the the museum quality, if we could put it that way, the museum quality design of right now is so incredibly impressive that it's almost difficult to keep up with the individual makers and do them justice. Joseph, your clients are definitely stars. Do you perceive yourself as a star designer? I don't think about it. I, mean, that's I know. A... You're too busy working. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. And can you say something about the exhibition? So this exhibition opened two nights ago at the American Irish Historical Society on Fifth Avenue, and it is extraordinary. Like, your heart drops. Can you say, how did you put together this exhibition? And I just want to say that the centerpiece is this watch cabinet. As, as I mentioned earlier, um, I had an exhibition in, in the same um, uh, building uh, with, with the American Art Historical Society uh, nine years ago. So um, in a way, this was a very nice opportunity to um, show the development in the work in that time. But also, this piece, for instance, is made for a client that bought a piece from that first exhibition. And the, the brief um, of, of somebody wanting a cabinet 
for his watches, for Fodor and Son that commission watches, could only happen through that kind of relationship that's built up over that period of time, his familiarity with the work, understanding of the work, the trust. Um, and we've been lucky to have that kind of ongoing relationship with clients that, that go further and further with the studio and challenge us with very special, um, special briefs. And, and this was a very challenging piece. It took three years. But it's very nice to go on a journey with a client that has an idea that is so um, unique in a way. Um, and that brings the best out in, in the work and challenges my team, challenges me, and uh, elevates We're probably everything. never going to see this cabinet because it goes to the client's home. That's, in a way, the idea for the exhibition was to show some of these projects that, that would not normally never be seen. So, have a good evening and thanks for being here with us.